okay we are live now good evening everyone good afternoon to and good morning from where you are watching us a wonderful a session is there for you waiting today we have a very special guest professor peter rob and uh, we we are we are going to talk about bad things and to whom they belong colonialism and india's workers and women professor rob doesn't need a formal introduction and we all have read her read, uh, read his work he is a professor emeritus and formerly professor of history of india chair of the center of south asian studies former head of the department of history and pro director at soas university of london he is a fellow of the royal historical society and a fellow council member and former president of royal asiatic society he currently is working on the late 19th century a book tentatively called the british and the bihar development in a colonial society his edited his 10 edited and co-edited volumes cover indo british relations institutions rural rural south asia local agrarian societies protest and identity ideologies race dalit movements and labor agriculture and development of his nine monographs three are about early calcutta and four wholly or partially on 19th and 20th century bihar so without further ado let me formally invite and welcome professor peter rop who is joining us from london this afternoon thank you so much sir for joining us for accepting our invitation it is such an honor to host you this afternoon thank you ashan it's it's a great pleasure um you given my title uh today i'll ex- attempt a very incomplete interrogation of one term colonialism through a few examples related to workers and women i'm suggesting we consider the job words do in the context that give them meaning in that way we see how often they're used without thinking and the precise meanings they should have the meanings they have in context and their attribution that is especially to whom the evils belong attribution matters because it limits meaning nowadays colonialism is treated as an evil analogous to slavery a term that usually has an explicit overtone of racism it popularly refers to what europeans did to non europeans both the attribution and the past tests tense are problematic i don't downplay the horrors of the atlantic slave trade and slavery in the americas but i wonder firstly what word we should now use for the slavery existing in most societies and periods including our own and secondly how we can square that with condemnation focused on people's who benefit in just one time and place colonialism too is related to race and often defined without nuance or comparison a recent and recent initiative claims colonialism equals theft i should refrain from commenting that this idea seems strong in the united states a union founded on land grabbing i should refrain because that's the kind of stereotyping i want to avoid namely today the idea that colonialism is not complex and various but just something bad current uses usage of the words slavery and colonialism invites demands for apologies i find this another puzzle if i hurt someone accidentally i apologize for the harm done if the harm was intentional i hope i had apologized for the motive as well but these norms of behavior don't make me apologize for damage done by a passing stranger let alone someone's great great grandparents a nation's government might apologize for something done long ago by a predecessor it's basically spurious but the um that i've gone off no i'm still on sorry um but the hang on sorry the this the thing went off my screen which is alarming um uh a nation's government might apologize for something done long ago by predecessors it's basically spurious but the fiction is that governments are entities that continue over time but should the inhabitants of a country apologize for things committed one or two hundred years ago should today's people of rome apologize for rome's ancient empire and slavery too while they're about it let's hear an apology from today's persians afghans and turks for the imperial conquest in india after all they may have some historical affinity or not 
with the conquerors. In passing, observe that that period of foreign rule is now called pre-colonial. Is the conflation less absurd for Britain and its empire? It's said about European colonialism that today's people have benefited from their ancestors' mistakes, but that's a false trap. An apology for colonialism made on behalf of today's British citizens would encompass a large majority whose ancestors suffered poverty and oppression and had no say whatsoever in colonialism, and about 20% whose ancestors were the colonized, not the colonizers. I'm glad it's not the job of the historians to adjudicate on who should apologize to whom. Direct British rule in India spread from tiny enclaves like COVID-19 and gets a similarly bad press today, even in Britain, except from nostalgic imperialists. In India, the prevailing narrative of anti-colonialism assumed a natural study against foreigners. In the nationalist view, all true Indians rejected British rule. Some on the socialist left, as well as the Hindu right, now implied that true Indians should condemn everything colonialism made or did. We will better understand colonialism's role in India by going beyond slogans and blame. We should distinguish its many different forms and features, as countless historians have tried to do, and consider it in the context of other conquests or dominion. I want to complicate the burdens, at least in regard to workers and women. Both, it seems, are not faring that well in India today. Appalling crimes against women have been widely publicized, as has violence against workers, particularly those who are poor, low caste or Muslim. In 2018, there was rioting in inland Maharashtra. Hindu fundamentalists attacked a large gathering of Dalits, mainly Maha by caste, near a town where the British East India Company won a battle against the Marathas in 1818. Some Mahars fought for the company, 22 died. Commemoration of the Baha'u casualties began in 1926, encouraged by Ambedkar. Arguably, a British victory was remembered as a symbol of resistance against high caste elites and Hindu chauvinism. In 2018, the chauvinists retaliated by killing people. My conclusion, Dalits were ambivalent towards colonial rule in the 1920s, and suspicious of high caste Hindu rule after independence. Neither of those positions was or is found only among Dalits. The company's wars with the Marathas were supposedly British wars against Indians, but Mahars fought on both sides, as did Rajputs, who also later served in the princely and British armies. The uprisings of 1857 were, of course, the first war of independence, but Sikhs and other Indians bore arms against the Indian rebels. Other collaboration was extremely widespread. Along with many colonial legacies, it reinforces the point that the impact of British rule was complex. India was damaged in many ways, but some Indians benefited. What is more, Indians suffered and still suffer daily oppression from other Indians on the basis of caste, religion, and gender. When egalitarian ideas and the rule of law were promoted under the East India Company, some Indians were shocked. They thought women and workers and Dalit should be kept in their place. Before 1947, some said that turning India over to a cadre of high caste men might not be the ideal outcome for every Indian. It was a self-serving suggestion from colonial diehards, but some Indians agreed. They resented oppression by other different Indians more than the impositions of distant foreigners. Their stories are less catchy than those about imperialist villains and victims, but they do reflect the evidence. So, what did British colonialism do for workers and women? That is the question. Even with such a limited focus, I cannot make comparisons with other colonialism or enslavement, but I can assess British impact against oppression relevant to my examples, namely caste and patriarchy. I want to present a kind of balance sheet of effects on the lives of two kinds of people who have in common that they can suffer under various forms of power. I should be focusing on government actions that worsened or improved conditions for these groups. I now turn to workers. I should be drawing partly on two of my books, Ideas Matter, published last year, 
and what is in fact, uh, as part of the introduction, now called agrarian uh, uh, development in a colonial society about the British in Bihar, which is to be published next month. Various changes for labor occurred in the colonial period. In some cases, harder, more re regulated ca categories were applied. The British emphasized individuals in English law, but strove to define types. For Indian workers, there was more physical movement, daily, seasonal, periodic, and permanent. There were new occupations and modes of employment. Finally, there were changes in working conditions and payments. The British intervened early in their own interest. In 1774, master and servant legislation was applied. By 1789, partly because of the shortage of building workers and servants in Calcutta, wages had been fixed for those employed in the town, whether by Europeans or not. The regulations were designed to limit costs and discipline workers. They criminalized workers' breaches of contract while providing only similar civil remedies against employers. Even so, and although the law was corruptly deployed, it provided limits on how badly workers might be treated. My own research on the late 18th century, discussed in another book, Useful Friendship, reveals many instances in which humble laborers or servants appeal to the magistrates for unpaid wages or breach of employment contracts. New factors were therefore introduced into the conditions of work in India. The law also provided a new the vocabulary. Slavery was redefined as work without wages. Labor relations were presented as a matter of contract. Arguably, the existence of legal rules contributed to social pressure that could discourage the worst forms of exploitation. As the state intervened, its policies and laws generated interests and claims to rights in conjunction with inherited privilege or independently. Different means became widely available to Indians for defining entities and framing demands. They can be traced to official categorizations and policies, as well as to political theorists and elitists. This is one effect to be traced to British rule. Later, I shall return to what it meant more generally. But all was not rosy for the workers. Colonial labor policies were biased towards urban and organized production, even though nearly three quarters of Indian workers were rural. <clears throat> Labour in large factories, even on plantations, was regulated, but the reality of 19th century fields was often missing in colonial reports. The complex forms of rural labour were hardly noticed. There was talk of slavery, but little attention to aggressive servitude. Similarly, almost no attention was paid to domestic servants. It followed that workers had remarkably different experiences under colonial law from semi-independent but coerced cultivators, to row workers and gangs, to migrants in factories or plantations. Labor was categorized very precisely in the so-called modern capitalist sectors, for example, tea plantations or jute and cotton mills. From the later 19th century laws, were applying, laws applying to larger factories took account of the age and gender of the workers. This related to a more general acknowledgement of childhood, and to stereotypical male prejudices about the character and capacity of women. As a whole, the agricultural sector was managed through revenue and tenancy laws, plus occasional agricultural research and investment, despite its massive contribution to the state's income. Rural labor was left alone in the main. Indeed, it was often invisible, subsumed into the peasantry, compared with labor in mills, plantations, or the army. Also neglected was most non-agricultural employment in, in the countryside, whether when it was ancillary to farming, also when it was separate. The artisans, the unskilled heavy laborers whom the British called coolies, itinerants of all kinds, holy men, traders, stockholders, and so on. The British despised some of these people and ignored others, paying little attention to their economic and social contributions. Itinerants were frequently associated with crime, especially after the sensationalized accounts of so-called tugging and the invented concept of congenital criminality. Labor mobility was more or less regulated. For overseas or internal plantations, it was a problem to public order. Movement was encouraged for military recruitment, public works, transport, and large-scale manufacturing. Why were different workers treated differently? Tea was obviously an export industry that mattered to Britain, 
and it was largely owned and managed by Europeans. But that was true of some other commercial crops, such as opium and indigo. Tea workers were of interest to the government mainly because movements of people attracted attention, particularly when there was loss of life en route, as happened notoriously with the river passage to Assam. Critics were also able to observe conditions because laborers had to be separately housed near their places of work. Similar considerations applied to factories with another largely migrant workforce, creating extra worries for town planners and during epidemics. Labor conditions in larger factories also received international attention to prevent what was regarded as unfair competition and to reduce the exploitation and suffering observed by campaigners. By contrast, much rural labor was under research and unregulated until the 20th century because most of it was only indirectly mattered to things uh, connected to things that really mattered to the British. Revenue, public order, and international trade. Many sources of government income seemed remote from work. Even the land revenue relied mainly on intermediaries of one kind or another. Not only landholders, but traders and moneylenders who provided cash when taxes were due. British rulers preferred not to pay much attention to the complex nature of rural production. They like to regard it as an all-round success that India was producing copious raw materials for English factories at competitive prices and consuming increasing amounts of those factories' cheap products. Many Indians were becoming poorer, but it was hoped that those who benefited, successful landlords, substantial tenants, overseers, merchants, and so on, would be unlikely to encourage disorder. The other main reason for ignoring rural labour was related to the way indigenous agricultural production was imagined. British rulers were not consistent. They devoted much judicial attention to the Hindu joint family and Muslim personal laws, and were even more concerned politically about those partly fictitious collectives, caste and religious community. But individual actors dominated their thinking about agriculture. The government believed the rural economy was managed mainly by peasant households, men, women, and children, though these might include bonded servants and could hire workers, especially specialists such as uh, plowmen or millers. Political and economic policy was targeted on independent agricultural producers, which left the bulk of the population at the margins. Official willingness to intervene more generally stopped short of the masses, except during crises of unrest, health, or subsistence. Agricultural workers were more or less ignored, but poorer households invariably labored for others, often under conditions of servitude, both in agriculture and as domestics. Most cultivators depended on others for credit, equipment and marketing, and most also worked collectively for irrigation roads or indeed temples. Official neglect of rural labor mattered because there was increasing need for remedies. Even leaving aside famine and epidemics that hit the poor hardest, normal conditions were turning against them. In the rural select, sector, pre-colonial land coal controllers often sought to produce unfree labour where there was fluctuating seasonal demand, despite a surplus of cultivable land. Under British rule, these strategies were enhanced by the growing value and exclusive possession of landed property, by increasing commercial production and eventually a rising population. More workers were losing control over their own labour. Castes seemed to respond to the worsening employment conditions by becoming more rigid and hierarchical. By 1900, bondage was a common strategy for low-level survival. In Gangetic Bihar, for example, where the density of population was greater than anywhere else in India, the average holding was only two-fifths of an acre, about 1,600 square meters. But the bulk of the land was in the hands of higher castes, either as tenants or as landlords. Workers with little or no land suffered. In the 1920s, some smaller landholders claimed labor was scarce because farm workers belonging to a limited number of castes were commanded by the larger landlords. Such workers were generally forbidden to work in the fields of others or for hire. One man who owned and managed about 70 acres employed around 15 permanent laborers. He paid them, he claimed, in small land grants and in kind, and would advance them up to 50 or 100 rupees for weddings and other purposes. In short, Labour was not paid at commercial rates, nor often in cash, and was controlled by debt. In Kachar Assam, the development of tea planting 
made the local inhabitants into landholders. So that according to one account in the 1860s, they would no longer labor on wages and even they did would be quite unequal to the demand. Such local workers did not have to adjust the working practices to fit in with new requirements. The outcome was the oppressive immigration system that brought thousands of workers into Assam. Colonial Bihar was different. It had European commercial involvement too, but land was becoming effectively scarce and poor landholders were in danger of being reduced to laborers. Labor had little choice but to work more intensively. The result was harsh. The ordinary wage and cash or kind was at or below the minimum needed to support an average household. The caste and political sanctions that reinforced this system did not diminish in fierceness. One historian noted almost in passing that in 1873, rural protesters in Pabna, Bengal, were not opposed to colonial rule, but to the rapacity of the new landlords. They looked to government and its laws to protect them. If laborers thought this too, their hopes were dashed. Instead, the master and servant rules potentially criminalized workers. The Indian Contract Act defined legally enforceable labor as well as other agreements. And there was a little effective limit on extrajudicial coercion. The British did eventually make gestures towards improving the lot of rural workers, for example, an act in Bengal in 1920 to regulate bonded labor contracts. But these had little effect, especially in Bihar. Bonded laborers could seldom appeal to the courts. For them, concerted resistance remained a desperate throw. Protest was best expressed, as in the past, by fleeing or by taking on additional work, sometimes in secret. In the 1930s, a sample inquiry into 392 bonded laborers showed that more than 40% had been bonded within the previous years, but only a small minority ever escaped. Most had even minimal pay for only 10 months per year. A majority held a little land in return for two months of unpaid work. Most bonds were informal and oral, based on small debts. Almost all was uh, incurred for marriage expenses, and often by parents on behalf of children who were then bonded. What produced this effect? Blame was placed on the workers' inertia. But the poorest were attracted to any work, however badly rewarded. Cultural norms had an effect shown most poignantly in the bonding of children by parents for marriage costs and frequent inheritance of bondage from one generation to another. The strata of society ranked lowest by, lowest by the elites had the worst experiences. Their, serving, their subservience was enforced by social deference and violence. They suffered from the recreation and strengthening of high caste orthodoxy that increasingly shaped public norms and behavior. Hinduism was not a congregational religion, but it was everywhere evident in caste, custom, popular culture, and architecture. There's a category of confusion and discussion, uh, incidentally, of Indian workers and Dalits. To treat them as identities of different kinds is to distort our understanding of both and of what was happening to them. Most Dalits were poor or bonded laborers. They suffered doubly from servitude and exclusion. Supposedly, they inherited failings from another life, often further polluted by their livelihood, defiling caste Hindus in their temples. For rural workers, my emphasis today has been on the inadequacy of British interventions. Colonialism was guilty of neglect, partly because it was colonial. There was impact from conditions the British helped to create. Huge impact, huge increases over the 19th century in commercial production, 6,000% growth in export shipping by tonnage, and even more in long distance internal trade. But most important for workers were conditions the rulers ignored. Moreover, even had they done more for agricultural labor, it would have been erected, directed at the wrong time. <clears throat> Known injustices in the payments and conditions for employment. This implies shortcomings in British understanding as well as action. Efforts would have been inadequate, not just because such laws tended to favor employers and the wealthy, or not in the usual sense. They would have been inadequate because labor laws would not have touched a whole gamut of socio-political discrimination. Above all, the proximate cause of workers suffering poverty was not oppression by foreign rulers. 
Even in modern factories and plantations, solidarity was initially qualified by, among other things, assistance of intermediaries and controlled workers, and the grafting of broadening religious and caste loyalties onto labor organization. Caste and ritual discrimination helped produce identification as a working class. Results may be judged from social conditions. Just after independence, life expectancy in India was 32 years, despite recent improvement, largely due to falling infant mortality. Of India's 361 million people, 70% were cultivators or laborers, and at least 7% of the workers were surplus, meaning underemployed. Literacy is another useful measure. In 1951, excluding the 38% age below 15, under 25% of Indian males were literate and less than 8% females, giving an average of 18%. The overall rate in Pakistan was 14%. Some other countries not directly colonized compared favorably, for example, China with 47%, Cuba 77, or Thailand 52. In the United Kingdom, the reported adult literacy rate was about 99%. But the context was not just colonialism. It was colonialism in India. Some other British colonies fared better. By 1950 in Fiji, 67% of those over 15 were literate. In Sri Lanka, 62%. I could easily make similar points about the subjection of women. Instead, I shall concentrate first on an aspect I noted at the outset about workers, namely the beginning of what we might call categories of entitlement. A new categorization of women is usually seen as developing in India from the later 19th century, when age limits were set for sexual relations with girls and different rules made for female workers. And as women's role began to be acknowledged in politics, within joint families, and even within marriage. Western and Indian reformers identified women as a separate category of beings entitled to status, protection, and benefits. Biology notwithstanding, there's nothing inevitable about this categorization any more than there was for say child or labor or Indian. It illustrates influences on Indian as well as European mores. It was connected with the slow unraveling of the patriarchal consensus alongside enhanced male celebration of domesticity, as reflected in John Stuart Mill's subjection, The Subjection of Women in 1869. He wrote in the first chapter, the legal subordination of one sex to the other is wrong in itself, and now one of the chief hindrances to human improvement. My marks today relate to a prehistory of the change and its dialectic aspects. I shall take examples of men's relations with women from the three books published in 2011 and 2014 that are based on the diaries of Richard Bletchenden, an Englishman who lived and worked in Calcutta between the 1780s and his death in 1822. He never married, but had a succession of concubines or bibis, relations that could be turbulent, passionate and sentimental. For that reason, the book I focused on concubines and wives was called Sex and Sensibility. One of Bletchenden's babies died after giving birth to the fifth of their children together. Two European doctors were unable to save her. She died quietly in Bletchenden's arms, having, he wrote, slept in them for near seven years and a half. She had always, he said, conducted herself with much modesty and propriety. He described how he cut off a lock of the poor creature's hair and threw himself on his bed. Melancholy beyond anything I could have conceived and little knew the love I still bore her till I lost her. As a Muslim, she was buried, attended by women, according to their ceremonies, in the grounds of a charity school that Bletchard and supported. At the graveside, he was, he said, frequently relieved by tears. Later, he was pensive and melancholy beyond the power of words. This description is relevant to a broader argument in my books on early Calcutta, that feelings and attitudes led many rights to be identified and certain conduct deemed correct or just, despite or maybe because of the many shortfalls in actual behavior. Even while not complying with moral codes, Europeans feared contamination from Euro Oriental laxity, 
needed order in conditions of novelty and stress, and were developing an imperialist and bourgeois self-image. It said they felt some compulsion to virtue. Hence, there were informal laws, uh, formal rules before there were laws. The Friendly Association of the Agency House paved the way for the commercial company under statute. Social pressure for the fair treatment of orphans, concubines, or servants prepared the ground for welfare systems, women's rights, and labor laws. The context was not only cha the challenges of India, but changes in Britain, where in the 17th and 18th centuries, society for the reformation of manners and for the propagation of the gospels proselytized for a virtuous Christian life. Women were key to this. During the 19th century, marriage was increasingly demanded as a mark of respectability albeit still governed by 18th century laws, making wives formally inferior to husbands. From the later 19th century, according to Alan Hunt, regulation of sexual conduct in Britain related to economic rivalry, discipline of workers, and the stress of empire. More specifically, gender politics have been regarded as symptoms of the modern state. The tendency among European men, described by Elaine Schauter, was to attribute passivity and irrationality to women, as also to so-called inferior races of people. In fact, it was said by scientific studies that applied physical as well as psychological, moral, or political justifications for women's supposed inferiority. Most accounts of interracial gender relations have separation and exploitation as their main themes. They're usually supposed to be expressions of power. And Stoller, following many others, linked empire with sexual mores and racial distance. Though desire was produced by control, she said, it was also managed in order to outlaw, outlaw the licentiousness of the tropics. Popular images of concubines and prostitution imply politics of male desire, powerful Euro men, European men exploiting powerless non-European women and girls. This emphasis on colonial and racial oppression is not quite universal. Geraldine Forbes, unlike others who treat women as victims, wrote of prostitutes and tried to find agency for them in three ways. First, she re referred to everyday resistance. Secondly, she listed independent actions or decisions, such as escaping from intolerable marriage or having an illicit love affair. Thirdly, she mentioned the role of women in promoting sex work by recruiting their own relatives or managing brothels. Concubines had attitudes and status and a capacity to act. Some were emotionally involved with their employer. Significant numbers of European wives lived in India from the late 18th century, but in Calcutta, three quarters of the Indian, of the European bachelors kept concubines, or bibis, who were not prostitutes, but a combination of housekeeper, wife, and mistress. Were Calcutta's concubines excluded from the gradual changes in women's status? Often, they were Indian Muslims. Without conversion, they could not become wives because Christian marriage would be celebrated only between Christians. A few marriages occurred through conversion to Islam by the Christian husbands, but that was not a realistic option for the vast majority in Calcutta. And why should Indian babies convert to Christianity to attain a status they perhaps neither understood nor desired? Other concubines were of mixed race or were European and Christian. For them, their willingness to be concubines proved their unsuitability to become wives. Hence, race, class, or respectability ensured that concubines remained unmarried, at least to their employers. The mirror image of the rise and reform of the bourgeois marriage, marriage was thus that concubines became less and less socially accepted. This is not dispute. But it must not follow that concubines had no choice in their lives, necessarily resented their lifestyle, and were becoming less comfortable. Their situation, though insecure and often invidious, was easier as a rich man's concubine than as a poor man's wife. Even upper-class wives had limited rights. Indeed, in regard to personal property, the position of a concubine was better than that of a legal, right, uh, a legal wife, except after the death of her employer. In England, for all the fame of 18th century blue stockings, women's legal situation began to improve only with the Married Women's Property Act of 1882, and the Matrimonial Causes Act of 1884. The detailed evidence from Bletchington's diary is diverse. It includes examples of concubines treated well, and it includes examples of concubines treated well and wives betrayed. 
but it does show accepted codes of conduct. They included fidelity and material and domestic responsibility for babies. Expectations of consideration, financial support, and social discretion from the man. And often a mutual affection and companionship. These ideas affected a shift in attitudes. The acceptable norms were becoming more favorable for women, as said, although there was no unambiguous movement towards respect and emancipation. But 40 or 50 years before John Stuart Mill, Bletchenden had already half admitted the injustice to women. In his eyes, they were always at a disadvantage materially and generally more vulnerable men, despite occasional chivalrous gestures and masculine qualms of conscience. After the death of the baby I described, he was beset by a succession of spirit and sometimes alcoholic ladies. He frequently softened at the thought of depriving the mother of her children and the children of their mother. And also in reaction to a shame a cast off mother might bring to the children if forced into prostitution. He took legal advice and was reassured on his guardianship by nature, a right over children vested in the male, even for married couples. But he reasoned, the less the law protects a feeble woman, the more considerate the man had to be. His sexual partners engaged his feelings, as already shown, and could cause him pain. The concubines talked back, talked back, fought back quite often, according to the diaries. They demanded to be treated not as a distinct category of humankind, rather than they rather than inferior appendages of man, that is, as thinking beings and individuals with moral and legal rights. A large number of entries in Bletchenden's diary detailed the provision made for concubines by Europeans as they left it or when they married. He undertook this on behalf of friends, no longer in Calcutta, and also tried to help women who had been abandoned. I think such experiences, in the context of the time and changing ideas, helped refine norms that came to be expected in men's conduct towards women. Sentiment triggered informal, but socially reinforced expectations of fair play and prefigured the later treatment of all women. What I wonder is the more general lesson of the rights concubines secured for more considerate parts partners. First, it would be wrong to think they transformed the position of Indian females. The impact of colonial rule on Indian women's lives was complex. In India as across the world, poor women undertook hard physical labor. Many suffered the doubled hardship of monopoly, monopoly monotony of both productive and domestic work. Women could have some property and resources, but these usually came from their father, brothers, or uncles. Arguably, a Hindu woman was defined by the men who controlled her, and then by a restrictive widowhood or an extremist death on her husband's funeral pyre. Seldom were pursuits mainly undertaken by women, even in the religious or artistic spheres, truly respectable. In India, service of one kind or another, including as a baby, was usually the only route to independence, although the rewards could be real. The baby whose death I described turned out to have owned a timber shop and a riverboat, unbeknownst to Legendon. Progress on women's rights, if such it was, was hardly smooth under colonial rule, nor was the British contribution necessarily progressive. In the 1830s, exploring the limits of radicalism, a Bengali observer noted that advocates of women's rights lived every day among practices they wanted to reform, and had mostly been married in their, teen, in their teens by parental command. Under British rule, the strengthening of patriarchal forces weakened women's situation, as many have recognized. To quote one scholar, the highest colonial judiciary assumed the inferiority of women in the 1880s, and 100 years later, independent India's courts continued to sustain savage legal positions which do little to help women. Even in 2018, an Indian law conference at uh, St. Anthony's College, Oxford, met to rethink gender equality and debate how to move towards the legal employment of women. I'm very aware too that the British contribution is only part of a complex story. As said at the outset, violence against women and girls continues. Nevertheless, secondly, 
Under colonial rule, there were slow positive moves that were part of a longer, larger trend. Rules for concubines mimicked the rules about wives because of intimacy and affection, fears about reputation, and the appearance of propriety, and the BB's independence and assertiveness. Though the rights and mores of wives and concubines were very different, they had a kind of equivalence on moral grounds when it came to ideas of acceptable treatment. And there was a tendency for those to be bundled into the impulse for increased regulation and order. Women were being regarded as individuals with rights and feelings, even while they were still being treated as servants and chattels. It's not wrong to concentrate on the indignities they suffered, but it is interesting also to notice what I suggest was a colonial diffusion of humanist ideals. Norms and law worked their influence, and they were colonial in origin, if that means substitution of the indigenous by the foreign. The classification of a standardized category or group, a reinforcement of the collective or the general, was needed before there could be assertion and protection of individual rights. Rights for everyone, whether citizens or subjects, too easily became rights for no one. The individuals first had to be seen. I should say a little more about rights. As is notorious and much discussed, the British analyzed society in terms of caste and communities, as, rather, as well as legal status or economic roles. Changes flowed from the endless categorizations. Very many quasi-Western political and social organizations were formed, initially by their needs. Print, postal services and railways obviously transformed communications between people, as did a host of government activities and institutions. Millions of Indians worked for or with the state or Western style agencies, secretariats, courts, messengers, surveys, public works, the army, and so on. All kinds of non government organizations also grew exponentially. Ideologies were altered as well as mechanisms. An important part of this process was the categorization of all things Indian, hence, by definition, distinct. But government practices also influence the formal social identities in terms of discourse, character, and rights. Among peasants, among workers, among Dalits, and among women, there was eventually organized protest, albeit not for the first time. The movements opposed felt disadvantages, but also the spread, normalization, and dominance of what were mainly high caste or religious customs and taboos. Both problems and opportunities were created for people of low status. On one hand, stereotypes about tradition, natural attitudes and identity favored those who were already powerful and advantaged and prioritized supposedly indigenous norms. So Brahmins, Kshatriyas and other high castes were regarded as leaders of a single religious community of Hindus. Muslims were believed to be essentially one body of followers of Islam. Landowners and certain resident cultivators were supposed to have ancient rights over land and people. Men, especially joint family heads, were thought universally to be controllers and protectors of women. None of these ideas unambiguously reflected real reality, but they were formative, like prophecies. Brahmins and their socio-political ideas were favored by government, became more dominant. Muslims did turn largely into a political community, despite their often bitter divisions and syncretic practices. The powerful became more entrenched behind the ramparts of their publicly accepted superiority. The effect on people of lower caste was evident in their subservience, oppression, and poverty. Yet, the idea that there were general categories of people and that such groups had rights offered a model even for the downtrodden. One element of this kind of thinking was its universalism. British laws and policies began to extend protection to the poor and the lowly. As said, this evidence in the late 18th century of awareness among servants and manual workers of new procedures and possibilities for redress. Throughout British rule, laws were passed giving rights to some workers and also recognizing women and defining children. They were creating legal and moral standards for equitable treatment of work in regard to property and even within families. On one hand, therefore, the period of British rule worsened the position of the weak as what was claimed as normal was painstakingly recentered and reinvented. On the other hand, the same processes could provide weapons of defense. 
A new type of politician sought legitimacy from the scale involvement of followers rather than from status or personal ability. Even radical Indian nationalists, regarded in British rhetoric as separate from the real India, soon began to mobilize mass support. They did so within a society containing obvious fractures, particularly those related to religion broadly defined. The most powerful political divides were between caste Hindus and outcasts or Dalits, and between Hindus and Muslims. But the interest of men could also be distinguished from those of women. Much organization and leadership focused on such communities as supposedly separate groups demanded to be treated separately and found their own leaders and organizations to represent them. The very term Dalit, a collective name for many oppressed and excluded groups, is an example of the creation of a unitary community demanding rights. Again, this was not all passive uh, or, or positive. For example, the Bengali spiritual leader Ramakrishna, no lover of women, castigated the modern wife for enslaving her husband. But there were counter images of strong, incorruptible females culminating in Mother India and of perfect wives. True companions, especially in nuclear families, a new version of domesticity. Middle class females became prominent in occupations and activities with prestige and influence. Political claims to rights had been reconfigured during colonial rule related to the principles of equity and law that the British professed to be bringing to India. Of course, as a general rule, such virtues were extolled everywhere for individuals and rulers, certainly in the Hindu and Persian traditions in India. But from the later 18th century, as the East India Company sought legitimacy in both Britain and India, it provided benefits to reconcile Indians to its rule. Even the principle of representation was conceded, initially to urban rate players. Above all, the rule of law was gradually introduced. Both changes marked a break from the Indian past. I've already remarked that the idea of equal rights regardless of status horrified many Indian elites. There was obvious discrepancy between the equity formally provided in Western law and the oppression redolent of Hindu caste. In a book published in 2010, the non-Brahmin writer, writer uh, D.R. Nar Nagaraj noted that Dalits suffered from colonial transformations of the colonial economy, politics and law, but benefited from the impact of Western liberal, egalitarian and ethical thinking. Before I finish the caveat, I've not tried to cover everything that could be relevant, not pursuing, for example, whether colonial institutions in general were too feeble or distorted to protect people. And I've dealt only tangentially with the important questions of ideology and sensibility. Put crudely, some people are complicit in their own suffering, and some act oppressively because they believe it right for them to do so. Such reactions are bolstered by organized systems of ideas, such as religion and social norms, as well as by individual rationalization. Women may help subjugate other women, including their daughters, and deny their own capacity or finer qualities. For labor, religious and national allegiances may be imagined to matter more than solidarity. One famous novel about so-called untouchables stresses their dependence and vulnerability, but also their obsession with minute status in a Hindu order, whose function, as one scholar put it, is to produce a passive acceptance of inferiority. Dalits may accept the need to improve in order to upgrade their social status, becoming more like a Brahmin, or Raj could say. To change things, education and alternative thinking are need, needed for both the oppression and the oppressor. A dominant view, we may remember, is that brutish serfs need the protection of a wise overlord. Weak women need the guidance of a strong man. Workers are beholden to the masters they obey. Poor workers, Dalits and women faced special combinations of marginality in both the market and the belief system. Western theories could not cope. Worse, the prejudices were shared and promulgated by many colonial administrators. That shaped colonialism. And yet it was not the whole story, as this talk has argued. On one hand, British rule deliberately strengthened the position of many dominant and wealthy people. Many colonial efforts of regulation and improvement were weak or inadequate in comparison with the need. The vast majority of Dalits and agricultural workers experienced little or no improvement during British rule. There was also intellectual, practical, and legal support for patria. 
but treating women as inferior, as in so many British attitudes and institutions, for increasing and widening female social seclusion and for denying women equal rights. On the other hand, many groups and types of people were affected by the reification of categories, by new aims and demands, and new forms of organization and communication. Some welcomed the ideas and the policies of the colonial rulers. The oppressed found a political voice. There was recognition of women as a distinct identity, in which followed improvements and opportunities through law, education, employment, and political activism. I know that such humanist, radical, and modernizing influences did not necessarily derive from the West, but British India provided a milieu that facilitated and nurtured them, as well as their opposites. Ideals adapted by Indians in colonial times have their legacy in organized labor and peasant societies and in demands that women and girls be treated as the equals of men and boys. I end some way from where I began. What conclusions have I reached about the evils of colonialism in India, whether they were exclusively British? It is that when we look at specific cases, it becomes hard to be sure what effects are or are not colonial or British. It's also that blanket ideas don't help, such as assuming that colonialism like racism can explain every instance of oppression and exploitation. On the contrary, colonial rule was varied and multifaceted and contributed both to the worsening of underlying problems such as disabilities suffered by workers and women and to their improvement, stronger rights, opportunities and responses. This is hardly a revolutionary thought, but it's one that is not compatible with some common stereotypes and polemics. Preparing this talk, I started with a sentence from Ishan Sharma attributed to, to Kaman. When you're in the present, you cannot not escape your past. And when you study history, you cannot escape the present. It's true, I think. But the choice of pronouns and definite articles is intriguing. I like to hope it's no attitude that history is the only noun not governed by either you, uh, your, or the. History unattributed can be a solution, but your history would be a problem. That's the one I wanted to address today. Language always obscures as much as it reveals. I'm reluctant to say its clarity is declining, but certainly semantic fashions are amplified nowadays. Some may be positive, reflecting, say, changed views about racism or climate change. Some may be for the worse, such as political jargon that hides corruption and oppression. But careless terminology, using words as slogans, is always likely to be detrimental. We should stand up for good communication against speech and writing that lacks awareness of meanings and of how language works. Even punctuation can affect meaning. As the joke puts it, let's eat grandma, or let's eat grandma. That is truly a merciful comma. Precision's precision about concepts is just as crucial. I argue for greater understanding of how they work historically in ways analogous to language itself. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Rob, for such an enriching and interesting lecture. And we have some questions for you from the audience. And uh, if you allow, I'll read those out for you. OK. Uh, this question is by Arun. And his question is, how do you see one British marrying Indian woman what was their status? Say that again. How do you see one British? Uh, uh, one British official or one British man marrying Indian woman. Ah. Um, well, well, there were. Um, I've, I've not particularly thought about that. There is, this is an age, after all, in which, um, for all the positive things I was saying, there's a good deal of... Um, well, put it crudely, racism, which um, affected um, of officials of, the, of, of India and people working in India, Europeans. Um, those Europeans, as famously known, um, who allegedly converted to Islam in order to marry 
women, high, high class Muslim women in the 18th century, fared very badly professionally. They were, they were, um, it, it was a bad move from their point of view. And therefore, um, that sort of thing was not encouraged. Um, the, the, this is also true, of course, in the curious, anomalous, and difficult position of the so called Anglo Indians, the Eurasians. Um, after all, the product of, of interracial um, liaison, though, though not originally marriage. And I do think there was a change there. In the 1820s and 30s, um, the, the Kidd brothers, who were um, two boys, two brothers, who were uh, the product of a, of a mixed race liaison, became very important figures. And their father um, was one of the founders of movements by Eurasians to get better status. I think that kind of pattern, that kind of ambiguity, um, that kind of ability for that to be overlooked, for these, for people in effect to, to get beyond that, that became much more difficult. And it became difficult because of racism. Racism was there in the 18th century, it was there in the early 19th century, it became more articulated. And therefore a person who was in a British company even, or in, a, or in an administrative position, um, particularly a person of status, um, it was discouraged for them to have marriage uh, relationships with women. And of course, you're still going back to the situation in which marriage was primarily a religious service, which required a liaison between believers. So I, I think it, it wasn't that common, and that's not surprising, um, because of that general milieu in, in, which, in which they occurred. Um, my Actually, my second um, Calcutta book, which is partly about servants and children, um, talks about the children who were all mixed race children of uh, Richard Bledgerton being sent to England to be turned into English people. And they actually succeeded. Um, they were, uh, they became English, their descendants were English, um, they moved all around the world uh, as regarded as Europeans, in spite of their origin in, in a mixed race um, um, relationship. And I think that was, you know, that even then was symbolic of, of, of why um, I can't say, oh, look, there was all this freedom of movement, there was all this um, uh, emotional and, and friendly contact with women. Of course, Indian society itself would not at all in favor of that either. So there were, there were problems on both sides. So I'm not holding up um, lots of um, Europeans in India um, married to lots of Indians. It, it didn't happen. Uh, the next question is by Sukhdev Sohel. His question is, how do you view works of William Dugby in the context of famine and impoverishment in India, as depicted in Prosperous British India, 1901. Is it verification of Dada Bhai Naroji's position or advance over it? Um, I mean, these are uh, extremely complicated questions. Um, and um, this uh, book that's coming out next month is, is mostly about that, um, in, although it's um, focused on agrarian development efforts, but it's really about why poverty became so, um, it, it did not um, improve um, despite the, the growth of the economy. And um, my feeling is that, um, that there's, a, there's a kind of, um, there's an atmosphere of, of blame. And of course, in the 19th century, those who criticized British rule, um, who were, were making a political point. And the argument was that Indians would be better running this themselves. And that the British in many ways had done things which had worsened the situation. Now, I think there is some truth in that. Um, but I also think that the reason the record um, from major famines uh, improved during the 20th century was a complicated one and some things were to do with policies that were set in, in place, um, which were then continued um, and continued after independence. My feeling about 
those policies is that they didn't do such a bad job also because of other reasons, climatic and, and other changes and communications and, and, and relief measures. They didn't do such a bad job of worsening the worst effects, but they did precious little about the underlying endemic poverty and starvation or near starvation of many people in the population, which is really what I was trying to say when I was talking about uh, the position of labor. So I think that it's, uh, it's a difficult question, it's a complicated question. And um, I'm not in the business of, of you know, endorsing 19th century slogans or, or, or anything else. It, and, it's, and it's, you can certainly make a case that the prosperity of India um, was at the expense, I mean, it, it clearly was um, more economically development by the by 1940s than it was in the uh, 1740s. But that was at a cost. And you can weigh up those things. You can also ask whether a lot of it would have happened anyway, as has happened across the world because of indirect colonialism, not, not direct rule. So I think these are counterfactuals in a way, which not that, um, you know, they're, they're not that useful as tools to, to, to make judgments about things. It's better to look at the individual cases and, and work out what the impact and what the effects of different things were. Yeah. Uh, the next question is by Alice Mason. Her question is, did the British workers during colonial empire in London and Manchester have formal employment? Were they treated with dignity? And how were, how were true treatments different around the that around for that period globally? Prostitution was rampant during that time around uh, London. Yeah, no, uh, uh, undoubtedly true. In fact, when I first of all said right at the beginning, should uh, should um, should people in Britain apologise for the empire? And I was saying that people descended from people that were really oppressed under the empire. The conditions of labour in um, in Britain were extremely bad um, until, well, it, it's certainly the last decades of the 19th century when we began to see some slight improvement. There were public health improvements and there were, benef be there were benefactors who were industrialists, as, as is well known, and, and for certain groups of workers, things got better. But the standard of housing, the standard of education, the standard of availability to, to better conditions um, was, was incredibly um, different and, um, and, and, and bad from the from point of view of people in Britain. The difference between India was that at this period, the major um, change in labor, its industrialization, its movement to the cities, the growth of the large cities, was not a phenomenon that you saw. Of course, there was growth of cities, but a, as a proportion of the labor force, uh, it was it remained small. Uh, what you've seen since independence, and particularly in the last twenty or thirty years, has been a, a growth of workers flocking to cities, and those cities have grown uh, fantastically, vastly. But still, the percentage of people in towns is is relatively small, um, much smaller than industrialized countries uh, in the West. And I think that's, it means it's a different situation. So a person stuck in a horrible tenement with no security of employment, um, with no proper food, um, with no proper income, with health problems, particularly if the breadwinner, who is almost always a man, died, as so many of them did, um, or became incapacitated through injury and so on, their position was appalling in a particular sort of way. But that doesn't mean that the people that were still in the countryside being pressed and, and exploited uh, did not also suffer. I mean, these are the people that were denied access to water during droughts and famines by, by uh, and, and the British relief efforts, particularly in the Deccan and so on, found it very, very difficult. To, to find ways in which people could have a fair, equitable access to water. And that was also true for, for crops. Now, if you just think of that simple uh, example, things were really, really bad for them. So they were bad in the, in the slums of, of London 
um, in health and in all sorts of other forms of well-being, but they were different. And, and um, they also, of course, um, during the 20th century, improved. By the way, I think in the 21st century, that improvement has not continued in, in, in the West. It's at the best stalled. Um, but so there's, there's nothing for Britain to say, oh gosh, we treated our workers perfectly and, and, they, and they treated workers in India badly. No, the, both sides, uh, those in power, um, some may be philanthropic, but as a general class, as a general influence, uh, you, you don't wait for them to, to, to do better. They need to be coerced into it. Uh, the next question is again by Sukhdev Sohel. How did Victorian mortality influence or affect women in India? Mortality? Yeah. God. Um, uh, morality. Yeah. Oh, morality. Uh, yeah. Yes. Mortality is also an interesting question, actually. Um, well, uh, I mean, th th there are two sides to this. There is the um, the almost the in, in infantilizing of women. The women have to be protected. They're, they're not up to it. And that still was very prevalent in, um, in, in India um, among Europeans, as it was in, at home in Britain. On the other hand, there were also these tendencies to regard women as having able to have a voice. And I think some of the women that were the mem subs, as it were, in India, who were um, the wives of influential and, and, and well-off men, they did in fact, they were able to, um, to create lives for themselves, um, interests, develop interests in social work, in art, um, in, in all sorts of activities. And that happened in Britain as well, but there were certain openings for them there. And I think maybe uh, the people that came to the men who came to in India were not the, the highest elite. You know, they, typically they were the younger sons or they were the, they were the people who were um, improving their position or trying to. And I think that applied to, to women very often as well. It, it wasn't necessarily for them a, a worse situation. But of course, they were within the strains of, of uh, what we like to call Victorian morality. Uh, the next question is by Shashi Kumar. His question is, how was the scenario in the case of Dalit migrants in the colonial period? I asked this question specifically because Dalit migrant condition was widely discussed during the pandemic period. But now, yes, um, this, this period, yes, indeed. Um, it's not a subject I have, um, the, the migrant part of it is not, it's not a subject I've, I've looked at. Um, Migrants, I mean, there's, there's emigration all the way to um, West Indies and Fiji and places like this, and, and they also varied. I mean, much of it was extremely bad and appalling. Uh, in some cases, those people, as it were, escaped that and, and made good over generations, and that's still evident today. Um, this was less, migrants, <coughs> In India, within India, um, there, were the, there were the people that went to factories. And um, some of those gradually over time um, got better status and better um, terms. Um, in the tea plantations, well, we, this has been much, um, it's, it's, it's been much talked about and much written about how bad those conditions were. Though again, there were some who were able to um, play off one plantation against another and, and, and get some better conditions. So it's, it's a, you know, there's a majority position would be bad, and then there's a majority, the minority position which is improved. Um, I think there's, there's nothing like um, the, the really large scale migration that of, of the 20th and 21st century. Um, and, and therefore, the scale of these things is, is better. And there was no, I mean, even during the isolation posed by the plague or the first influenza epidemic, in both of which the loss of life in India was 
appalling. Uh, but there's no real equivalent of, you know, people being, out, being told that they've got, in effect, setting off to walk home hundreds of miles. I mean, that, that, that is, a, that's a new phenomenon. And the numbers of people involved are much greater. But I wouldn't like to pretend that, that um, for most people that the, the migration was a good thing. It, 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 it was mostly caused by despair. And it's like refugees today. They, they leave for a better life. Why do they leave for a better life? Because their existing life is appalling. And all the risks and all the dangers are taken. And, and, and that's always been true. And it, it was true in the 19th century as well. Though there were recruiters who um, gave people, um, um, you know, it, it, um, they, they paid for the costs of the move and, and, they, and they were then uh, providing them with work. And to be honest, uh, that's not a great system, but it's better than someone randomly turning up and hoping that by some luck, they can um, make a living uh, in, in a city or in another place. And, and so these are all matters of degree. Uh, we will take one last question. I don't know if it relates to your study currently, but this question is by Simran. Her question is, how do you see the position of Anglo-Indians residing in India in the present times? Yeah, my, my, my knowledge of this is, is, is small. Um, I have personal, I mean, I, I know some, um, and I had um, a, a PhD student many years ago who was married, she was an English girl married to a woman, married to a, an Anglo-Indian man, and they, uh, um, she, she did research uh, on it. And so I had a bit of that second hand. Um, I, I'm not uh, in a position to know, but you do know that there have been, um, there have been distressing cases of uh, prejudice and of, um, uh, of, of violence against um, particularly Christians, um, but Anglo-Indians, Eurasians as well. I mean, the idea, uh, they were in an anomalous position during the British rule because um, literally they were neither one thing nor the other. And the British didn't really accept them. And most Indians didn't really accept them either. They benefited by certain specialist occupations, the railways being the obvious example. And they also were able to um, become sort of in minor roles in support of the Raj. The, the transition into modern India and, and, and Pakistan and Bangladesh for those people was inevitably going to be difficult. Um, there were many who came to this country and some of them um, disappeared. They, uh, in fact, I know some of those too. Um, in fact, I, I, the, the, there's a friend whose um, father um, was an anger and still keeps up ties actually still goes back to it or used to in the, in the days when he could go, go back a couple of times to India to, to keep up ties but never presented himself as an Indian or an Anglo-Indian in Britain and it wasn't until he met us and started to talk to us he, he, he opened up and told us all about his, his background and his daughter said he's never talked about that before so I think there's a, that kind of reaction which goes on and it's not just true of, of those people, it's true of all peoples who find themselves marginalized in situations in which they're not necessarily connected, not necessarily respected. Um, and uh, I mean, in London, um, until very recently, the great glory of London as a city was that it was so mixed. And um, I'm originally from New Zealand and that's also although it has problems on racial grounds, it's also very mixed. The Maori population in New Zealand has no so-called pure blooded, whatever that is, Maori left and hasn't had since the 30s or 40s. So it's a society in which it, it's impossible to say, except by self um, identification very often, whether someone is of this race or another race. And, and where that happens and where societies almost welcome it, um, then the position of those people is better. On the other hand, 
There aren't very many societies which are unqualified like that. And so I've, I've, my feeling about um, people like Anglo Indians in India is that there's all sorts of difficulties they have in repositioning themselves. The, the, the empire which produced them is gone. The new society has its own ideas and, and preferences. And um, they've lost their, largely, lost a lot of their hold on particular occupations. Hmm. It's hard. So um, that's, I mean, that's really scraping the barrel of what little I don't, what, what little I know, of much I don't know about the situation for them now. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Roth, for taking our time from your schedule to do this lecture. It was truly really an honor hosting you. Well, it's been, it's been, it's been a great pleasure. Um, and I've watched a, a large number of these um, online over the lockdown. And this is the first one I've actually done. So it's, a, it's an interesting experience on, on all sides. <laughs> So I, I hope you enjoyed it. And I shall refrain from following it on YouTube later in case I'm too poor. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, sir. And we hope to have you again very soon. Okay. I don't know about that, but yes. <laughs> yeah. Best. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye, sir.